Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And just one more show after today before I take my little break for a while to go and do my proper job of D-Day guiding. But we are back with another return guest. Ronald Yeltes was on like this time, well, no, a bit, bit later in the year last year, talking about the 8th Battalion Rifle Brigade in Normandy. And today we are picking up the story for from when they began their move into Germany. So just before I bring Ronald in, a reminder again, if you're watching for the first time or even a repeat viewer, don't forget to click like, don't forget to subscribe, and don't forget to click the bell to receive notifications. And if you look at the YouTube description, pull, you know, expand it down. You have all the links you'll need to books, websites, resources, and all the things that support what we're doing here. Ronald's website about the 8th Rifle Brigade is, for some reason, not functioning right now, but the link is in there for when it gets back up online. You can use that. And as usual, um, just thank you for being here and watching. Uh, and please keep your comments coming away in the sidebar. We don't get to every single the, uh, one of the questions you ask. We don't get to all the comments because we're gradually building up a bigger, bigger audience, which is great. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to bring Ronald in. So uh, good evening, Ronald. How are you today? Hello, Paul. Yes, I'm uh, doing fine. And thank you. It's good to be back again. Good. So we're going to bring up the PowerPoint straight away and we're going to begin the story because just to set the scene, already in the last few days, we've tackled the crossing of the Rhine, Operation Varsity with James Fenelon. We talked a little bit about um, the Remagen Bridge came up in various discussions. We had Don M. Fox talking about Task Force Baum and the, the, the attempt to go and rescue um, Patton's son-in-law from the prisoner war camp. So this is the time of year, 77 years ago, where the Allies are really, from both sides, from the, from the East and the West, they're really pushing Ger the Germans back into Germany. And the recurring theme we were talking about, Ronald, is, is how people often overlook this period in history because they kind of skip straight from the end of the Battle of the Bulge to VE Day. And at this point, they kind of think the Germans are just beaten and there's not much going on. But as you will tell us, there's a lot still going on. So do you find this particular period really interesting when you're studying the Rifle Brigade? Yes, it, it certainly is a, a very interesting period. It's, it's, uh, as you say, it's quite often overlooked. Um, but well, as a, the, the presentation, there has been a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of, and a lot of um, difficulties going on, and also a lot of losses still of, of the brigade. So it was. Um, yeah, it was certainly a very intense period for the for the men of the rifle brigade. Yeah, and just I'll let you start the presentation. But w where would you say their morale is at this point? There, because you know they've been in the line now for for you know nine ten months. They've seen some you know a lot of combat, a lot of campaigning, a lot of distance yeah. they've travelled. So are, are they still is morale high or are they fading a bit? Yeah, they, they, they had landed in Normandy, of course, um, about no, well, a week after the day, uh, fought a lot of battles in Normandy, then um, advanced uh, after crossing the Seine, River Seine. They liberated, liberated Amiens and Antwerp and um, uh, seen some, some very fierce fighting also in, in Belgium just before Arnhem. They had a role in, in, in protecting the east flank of, of Market Garden and Holland. Uh, they also actually fought in the, the Battle of the Bulge um, um, during a period in which they should have had their, their well, so to speak, Christmas break, but that uh, was interrupted. But, um, yeah, funnily or strangely enough, uh, the, the morale was really very high, still was still was very high. Um, they'd seen big losses, but um, the, the, they had also been... Well, actually, every time they had been very successful in what, what they had been doing. Um, and I think they also felt um, that they the knew they were going to cross the Rhine in, uh, by the end of March. Uh, well, it wasn't, wasn't announced long before that, of course. But they knew where they were going. And they also knew that, of course, they wanted to go back home. Uh, and they really knew this would be the final, um, uh, final push. So yes, uh, I think right up till the end, morale remained very high within uh, within the battalion. Good. So mm -hmm. remind us again uh, where a lot of your information comes from. You have these amazing audio files that we're going to be playing three of later on. So 
you know, because Don Gillette was a big part of the last show and he's a big part of this show. So remind the viewers who he is and how you came into present, you know, these, these audio tapes. Yeah, I got to know uh, his photos in, in this uh, slide. I got to know him in the late 1990s. And um, a little later, um, well, we got along quite well. A little later, he sent me these, uh, these audio tapes. So some 12 hours of his, uh, well, let's say, adventures uh, between June 44 and, and May 1945. Uh, a bit later, I also got the, the tapes of the earlier part of the war. Um, but that, that really set me going. I felt I had to do something with it. In the end, it resulted in a, in a book. And later also uh, had his, his autobiography based on these tapes. It's really his, his story, which is in that, in it. And I'm not, not about the television as a whole. Uh, then I figured I had a lot of material. So I also began a website. I put a, a group on, on Facebook. And because of knowing, um, I also discovered the names of all the members of the battalion. And from then on, uh, let's say the last uh, three years or so, I also got in, got in touch with a lot of family members. So the, 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 the amount of information and the amount of material and also photos, because apparently lots of men had cameras with them um, during the campaign. Well, lots, but quite a few had kept cameras with them during the campaign. So also the, the, the amount of stories and the amount of photos is ever growing. Uh, and, it, and it's a two way situation i i can also inform a family member sometimes about uh, their relatives and uh, they sometimes give me uh, very interesting material yeah we're, we're getting that your audio is breaking up a little bit ronald try switching your video off and just having the audio on that might improve the signal a bit okay let's see what i can do about that uh, you should just just stop cam uh, let me see there we are. So, yep, that, sh that should that things. should help out with the audio. Sorry about that, but it was it was breaking up a bit, so okay. um, it should be better now. Yes. Yep, that's better. Good. So, um, okay. back to you. Carry on, please. No. So, um, as I say, the, the amount of material is ever growing. So uh, there's also some um, also quite fresh photos in in this presentation. But, uh, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, we can can go to the next uh, next slide. Now, um, as well, the subject of tonight, of course, is, is um, the Eighth Rifle in Germany. It's really this final push. And this photo or this this map which you see here, uh, which is um, how do you say it, compiled from from wartime um, the British uh, army maps. You can see Holland to the east, with the Amsterdam again, and the, the Danish border um, to the north. And it's um, it's a stretch of about uh, 300 miles or 500 kilometers from von Wesel, uh, where the Rhine had been crossed just a few days earlier during uh, Operation City. Um, so the Wesel from uh, almost to the Danish border, a stretch of about 500 miles. Um, well, the places you'll see here, I'll, I'll show this map several times so you don't have to remember all of them. But one, of course, which, which really sticks out is the, 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 the town of Belsen, uh, Bergen Belsen, which was uh, liberated in mid April by uh, with 23rd Hussars, another unit of the, of the 11th Armored. Uh, and well, as you said earlier, often uh, this stage of the war is just considered um, to be more or less a, a walkover, um, um, like like well, like it's been the easy part of the war. But it, it hasn't been not only for the Eighth Rifle Brigade. So they, they still had a casualty rate, casualty rate of some uh, or eleven percent, so nearly one hundred people. With uh, 29 killed and then uh, over 60 being wounded, um, so it was. Um, it certainly wasn't a war over. Um, well, I'm, I'm saying 10 or 11 percent, but 
also it was very difficult at, at this stage to replace um, uh, to replace casualties. So I think that the percentage compared to the actual strength may, may have been higher even. I hope I'm, you can hear me clearly now. Or... It, it's, it's still breaking up a bit. I was just, is your phone also connected to the Wi-Fi signal? Uh, no. No. Um, is because it's still a bit. It's still not particularly good. Um, really. Unfortunately, um, we we are breaking up a little bit. Um, try try leaving and coming back again. Try dropping out and coming back okay. in. Sorry about this, folks. As usual, it was working fine when we were having our chat half an hour ago. But then as soon as you go live, it goes weird. It's just that's how it is sometimes. Um, internet connection we'll see what happens when he comes back um i don't know how to resolve this sometimes yes these was fine and say so it was fine 20 minutes ago boom suddenly it goes cutting out but anyway uh tomorrow's show by the way while we're waiting for ronald to come back in is the third part of our series about u.s military crime with mark turner but this time we're actually going to do the actual kind of murders themselves i'll finish off that little series and i've just been posting online these shows beginning for Eastern Front Week, which starts when I get back from my tour in April. So uh, started to show, uh, put those shows up on YouTube so you can have an idea what we've got coming up. We've got one about German POWs in Soviet Union. Uh, David Stahl is coming back to talk about the retreat from Moscow and various other shows I'm lining up right now. So don't think just because I'm taking a break, a week, a week off, I'm not thinking about the future because there are lots of things coming up. But well, hopefully Ron will be back in a minute and we can carry on with this. It's um. We'll see what happens with the audio. Hopefully he'll be back soon. But um, yeah, so Ronald was saying his website, if you didn't catch it all, uh, the, Red, the 8th Battalion Rifle Brigade published a list of 1,600 names of people who served back in uh, at the end of the war. So um, that's where a lot of the information came from. Right, we'll bring you back in. Have a try now. Okay. Try again. Yep. Again, try switching the camera off. It helps out a bit. It does look a bit better this time. So we'll... we'll We'll, we'll try again. That's gotcha. Um, we'll try to go on. Um, no, as, uh, as I said, um, uh, nearly 100 casualties. Um, and then, well, so, so still a very, very difficult part of the war. And if you go to the next slide, uh, that explains a little bit why uh, this was so. Um, because after crossing the Rhine, um, yeah, they still had some some seven canals and rivers to cross. So they were, well, sometimes easy, sometimes very difficult uh, barriers to take. And also, of course, uh, the Germans that were defending their homeland. Um, well, I think it was clear to everyone, uh, even to the Germans themselves, it must have been clear that they truly lost the war. But still, uh, resistance was, was really kept up uh, right until the end. So that was um, not only causing casualties, but also uh, very frustrating uh, uh, for, for the troops um, because it, it was so unnecessary, uh, not, not only in backside, not only looking back. So this is um, yeah, the area we're talking about and the villages we're talking about. And um, well, I'm going to try to take us gradually through these uh, various stages. Um, but before we do so, on the, on the next slide, uh, Paul. Now, here's a little bit about the organization um, um, which the battalion was part of. Um, for this, this final part of the war, um, the 8th Rifle Brigade, well, they always had been uh, already for long before uh, D-Day, since, since 1941. Part of the 11th Armored Division. Which again was part of the um, of Eighth Corps. Um, I think altogether Eighth Corps must have been, well, I think, well over fifty thousand uh, people, so a really large, uh, a very large unit. Um, and after um, the end of March, it consisted of uh, not only the Eleventh Armored Division, uh, the, the the Black Bull uh, in, the, in the yellow square, but also Sixth Airborne Division and Fifteenth uh, uh, Scottish uh, Infantry Division. Uh, and two uh, independent um, uh, brigades, uh, one commando brigade and sixth armored uh, brigade. 
Guards Armored Brigade. Um, within the 11th Armored Division, uh, the 8th Rifle Brigade was part of the 29th Armored Brigade. You had one Armored Brigade, one Infantry Brigade. Uh, and the 8th Rifle Brigade itself was commanded by 30-year-old uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tony Hunter, uh, a desert veteran. Uh, who had taken over the battalion in, um, I think, late July 1944. Um, I think we can go to, to the next one. Now, and the, uh, I just, as I just mentioned, um, the, the 8th Rifle Brigade was part of the um, uh, 29th Armored Brigade. Um, you know, British names are they're terrible. The 8th Rifle Brigade, it's a battalion, it's not a brigade. But I'm not going into that because I find it too difficult to explain. But uh, anyway, the 8th Rifle Brigade um, was in the 29th Armored Brigade together with three tank regiments. And we see here the 23rd is ours, 3rd Royal Tank Regiment, and the 2nd, 5th, and 4th for Yeomanry. And these uh, had been equipped um, uh, in, in early 1945 with a new Comet tank. And they were the only armored regiments to be equipped with a new type of tank, which was a much better, large improvement uh, compared to the German tank, not only in, in armor, but also in the in the gun, uh, which it had was which was well, um, you know, much much better up to the um, let's say the German, which had to be dealt with. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and the the eighth rifle brigade itself it consists of four companies. Um, three motor companies, which were equipped, we can see it on the right, which were equipped with uh, bring gun carriers. Um, they, they were the scout, um, the scout platoons, and also with uh, half tracks, uh, which can also be seen in the right hand side of the slide. So there are three companies, each attached to, to one of these tank regiments. And then you also had E Company. They were equipped with anti-tank guns and uh, machine guns uh, mounted on um, on brain gun carriers, uh, which you can just make out in the, the lower picture in the yep. in the center. And this was not, not, a, not a fixed organization. Sometimes all three companies were attached to just one uh, tank regiment, and maybe the other tank regiments uh, were attached to, um, to some of the inf infantry battalions in the infantry brigade within 11th armored so it was it was a very flexible organization uh, depending on the parts and i guess one at this point of the war so that, that, sorry that they're, they're very good at working together i mean the cooperation has been building for months now so they're yes they're, they're performing at their kind of peak by now everybody knows everybody else they they all know what they're good at and what their their their, their roles are so it's the it's 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 the reward for their length of time in combat, I guess. Is there getting yeah, they, they were having a lot of experience, of course, and that they were um, well, really, how you say, it, adaptive or yep. flexible, uh, and they, they cooperate very easily. All the all the tank regiments, with well, all companies or whatever you want within the yeah, not not only within Twenty North Ninth Armored Brigade, but also in this infantry brigade that they. Yeah, the division was a, a very um, yeah, well-performing yeah. organization. Super. Yeah. Um, so that, that well, that gives us that gives us a rough idea of um, of the tank regiments and the Eighth Rifle Brigade itself. So it, it had a role as as a reconnaissance unit, as a very mobile uh, infantry to cooperate. And maybe to round up prisoners or to, to deal with uh, certain pockets of resistance. So it, uh, they were really interdependent. Tanks couldn't work without the infantry and the other way around. Yeah. Um, so I think from the next slide, we, we go into Germany. Um, here you see this, this first part. As I say, the, the, run -off, uh, the crossing of the Rhine was taken by these um, uh, airborne, American and British airborne units. Also, the 15th uh, Scottish Division itself was involved. Uh, it was taken um, a few days only earlier, I think the 24th, 25th yep. of, of March. 
And um, as these um, as these river crossings were made, the Eighth Rifle Brigade itself was still in Belgium. So, well, let's let's go to the next uh, to the next slide. As I said, um, the Eighth Rifle Brigade itself was still in Belgium uh, even on the morning of the twenty eighth of March. They had been training with these uh, with their tank regiments and with these new Tom and Comet uh, tanks. And um, they had to, to travel uh, some, some 130 miles from a uh, little east of Brussels to the German city of, of Basel, or what remained of, of the city. Um, and as I say, um, in, the, in the background of this uh, photo on the right, you can just make out a um, destroyed railway bridge. I don't know if you can zoom in, uh, Paul, but... I can't, no, not on this, no, not anymore. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. No, you can... Um, well, you, you, you might be able to make out a destroyed rail, railway bridge on, 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 the, on the upper right. Yeah. Uh, also, on the, in the upper part of the picture, you see the river. Right? And you maybe you can also see two uh, bridges, temporary bridges, Bailey bridges or, or pontoon bridges crossing the Rhine here. And it was across these bridges that uh, the 8th Battalion crossed the River Rhine. Um, so they, they arrived there by about noon, midday, and uh, then traveled on, uh, I think, about eight miles to the northeast of uh, the city of Basel to the village of Brunen, where they stayed for the night. And, and they really had to, to continue their, um, their advance because uh, there were there are really hundreds and hundreds or thousands upon thousands of vehicles um, are queuing up towards these bridges, uh, which in themselves were protected by, uh, by anti-aircraft fire and by uh, barrage balloons and with the RAF overhead. So it was an yeah, extremely busy, um, busy area, the, this crossing area. So they, they really had to move on. Village of Brunen, where they ended uh, the 28th of March, uh, a few days earlier. Um, yeah, here we see the, the, the city of Wesel again. It was uh, not, not much uh, remained of uh, by the uh, But also the, the character of the battle changed, changed a lot. Um, um, yeah, there were the, uh, they knew, of course, they were, they were entering Germany, the, the well, enemy uh, enemy area. So there was a lot less um, uh, feeling or feeling of fear about uh, the situation of these uh, of these conquered people, or in other countries, the people that had been liberated. Um, so yes, it is. It, it Now, we, we've, we, we've lost your audio again, unfortunately, uh, Ronald. We, we, you've broken up completely. Uh, yeah, we, we, we've lost you completely. We, we, it's broken up completely. Damn, it was getting, it was all going so well. Um, Bear with us, folks. We'll sort this out. Uh, no, we lost you completely, Ronald. Hang on, folks. Try, try, try leaving and coming out again. I heard, heard no, nothing from you apart from pops. Different turn, the approach. We're, hang on, hang on. We're, we're, we've not had you for about two minutes now, Ron. We've lost your audio completely. Hang on. 
I'll drop him out and hope he'll come back in again. Try, try leaving, Ronald, and coming back again. I've been asked to sing a song while we're waiting. I I'm not good at singing songs. I'm going to try and... Well, Ronald's gone. I hope he'll come back in again. This is so annoying when this happens. I say, people sometimes think, oh, you're not very professional about this. Honestly, we do the test. It works fine. And then suddenly you do it and it just goes weird again. It's just one of those things. It's... um. Um, nothing much we can do about it, really. Um, we will just hopefully he'll come back in and we can carry on. It's um really good, and I admire people like Ronald, who's don't forget he's not a professional historian, this is an amateur project. The website he runs is a, is a hobby, he's doing this presentation, his second language, and we know it's to be commended, right? Yeah. Really sorry about this, uh, but no worries. We we switched off everything else uh, in our house, so let, let's hope that that helps. Um... Okay, so we we got up to the point where you were talking about the 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 situation being a bit different when they arrived in vessel, and then then from that we didn't hear anything. So so okay. carry on, please. Now the situation, of course, changed. That they're now in enemy country instead of occupied countries. So the the feeling all also towards um, the population or private property or whatever changes uh, changes a lot. Um, uh, which well, you you can read it here, um, but you will also find some examples later on in the in the presentation. Um, don't know if, if you got that part, but Brunnen, eh, where they had spent the, the previous night, that was also the area where they joined up again with these uh, tank regiments, which of course had been transported uh, there with uh, on on tank um, uh, trailers, tank transport. Um, and on the 29th, uh, the breakout uh, out of the bridge had started. And well, during the day, funnily enough, that they were still hindered uh, more by, by traffic jams, uh, etc., inside the bridgehead than by anything out, outside it. So that day, that day, they only advanced some, some, some 10 miles or so um, to the east. But um, yeah, they had left the, the bridgehead, and on the 29th, so today, 77 years ago, uh, yeah, this breakout, this final push had really started uh, for them. Um, I think we can go yeah, to the next one. Yeah, maybe it, I think I forgot to, to mention it in, in the earlier slide, but, but um, yeah, the 11th Armored and then the 8th Corps, they, they were really forming up the, the well, say, the right hand side of the British and Canadian advance towards the north. Uh, so it's a for their area, they were really the ones who had to, to realize this advance towards the Baltic. Um, so um, everything is going fine. The, the day before, they had hindered, been hindered more by traffic jams than anything else, anything the Germans could throw at them. So they were really having things like, like northern France again, where they had been, been swanning. I don't know if people know this expression, but really freely advancing a bit disorganized without uh, too much opposition. And uh, there was a great, great feeling of confidence uh, at that moment. And um, well, it, they, they went on swarming uh, for about 20 miles. But then when they, they arrived at the village of Holtwick, or a little before that, uh, things began to change. The division was held up there by um, my Germans with uh, the bazooka men at the time, but they were Germans with the Panzerfaust, these uh, hand handheld uh, tank um, uh, projectiles. Uh, and they were held up there by um, uh, not only Edge Company, but also G Company, and from two different spots. They were held up by these Germans. Um, and uh, well, Tom Gillett, who we saw earlier, he not only witnesses did the hold up of H Company, but he also took, uh, took a partner. And I think um, the situation is where you see this, this yellow circle. They were held up by, uh, or Dingo Scout Corps was taken out by one of these uh, Panzerfausts, uh, the occupants that he killed. And the advance, of course, had to continue. So uh, uh, Apparently, from the position where he was in, uh, Don Gillett was uh, called up for this. 
Uh, I've put in this little sound fragment, which we can, can play in a moment. And uh, well, the only thing I want to add is um, that his, uh, his gunner in his brain carrier, he was, uh, he was a carpet salesman before the war and also after it. And that's, uh, that's an important detail to, to know uh, before we get to the yeah, you, Your audio is breaking up a little bit. Again, try switching the video off. Just have the yes. audio. Hope it'll okay. make it better. And then, and then should we play the clip now then? Yes. So this, folks, is 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 the audio recording. So it it this should this this will play fine because I've tested it already. So we'll we'll hopefully it'll allow the the internet connection to get back in. So here here we go. So it was now to be our task to drive up to the front of that column, to approach the dingo of the Inns of Court Regiment, to get round it, carefully avoiding the bodies, and to find out what had hit it, and if possible, to deal with whatever hit it. But, of course, when I first got the order to move, I had absolutely no idea what I was going into. Now, I can't remember who my driver was, but I do remember the gunner very clearly. He was a reinforcement from the King's Royal Rifle Corps and was rather older than most of us. He was probably well over 30, and if I would compare him to anything at all that I knew, he looked very like the little man in the Scroob cartoons in the Daily Express before the war. He was therefore apparently the mildest little man you could possibly imagine, but he was about to have a disagreement with the enemy and his moment of glory. So we edged towards this uh, armoured car, and as we got up to it, it was not a pretty sight with these three poor fellows lying dead in the road, and if you had to go beyond it and find what had killed them, it was not terribly encouraging. But in any case, we had to get round the armoured car before we could see what the geography was from then onwards. And we didn't have very much time to make up our minds. But quickly I saw that on the left-hand turn, there was a wood. And beside the wood, there was a cart track. So I decided speed was essential. So we quickly turned left and then right into this cart track, skirting the wood. And at that point, I told the Bren gunner, little William Perring, to fire at everything that moved and most things that didn't and at the same time I turned my own browning on the wood because if there was anything there that had got that car it would have been in the wood so the answer was a blanket shoot make them keep their heads down so this is what we did the driver speedily got round the vehicle and we turned left and made our way onto this track with fields on our left. It was bright sunshine, so we had the open fields on our left and the darkish wood on the right. And the other two chaps on the carrier were absolutely first class. It was a wonderful team effort, this. The driver kept up a spanking pace so that it was very difficult for anybody to focus a, a weapon of any kind on us. And old Perring and I were blazing away with our respective guns. At least I thought we were. I was certainly blazing away with mine. But apparently, at a certain point, he must have stopped. For suddenly, there was, just behind us, the most colossal explosion. Well, on these occasions, the first thing you think of is a mine. And I thought we'd gone over one. And so did the driver, because instinctively, he stopped. And I immediately looked back in the carrier to see where the gunner had been if he'd been blown away. But he hadn't. He was standing there looking remarkably as if he was about to sell me a carpet and looking as mild as ever. I said, what the bloody hell's going on? What was that? He said, it was him. I said, who? Is that bastard. And he pointed into the edge of the wood. And there was a slit trench with a couple of Germans in it. One was obviously an officer, and he had a panzerfaust in his hand, and the other was another rank. So I said, well, what, what was the explosion, Bill? He said, I threw a grenade at him. He was going to try and hit us with that bloody thing. Brilliant account. So, yes, that was uh, the first uh, spot of trouble, uh, Holtwick. But... Uh, 
No, that was overcome. No, that day without uh, without casualties, luckily. But uh, yes, yeah, so that was about to change um, in the next in the next phase, unfortunately. Um, so yes, we go through these uh, these next days. Uh, the early part of uh, part of April, and then the, the river crossings uh, they start. Um, the Ems, um, Ems River and the uh, the Dortmund Ems Canal and the, the Ems Weser Canal. Um, and we can see this first uh, crossing that has been made on, on the next slide. Um, so on the, on the 31st, um, after uh, spending the night a little bit east of, of Holtwick, uh, very early in the morning, um, the third Royal, Royal Tank Regiment together with G Company, they, they start the advance again. And a few hours later, they reach this, um, this Ems River, um, at Ems Detton. Um, well, not, not assuming many people not know all these players' names, so I'll try to avoid a few from um, the next part. But there they find the bridge to be blown. And then they push a little bit north, uh, where they find a, a spot where um, a river crossing can be made. Um, uh, by the end of the day, or by the end of the afternoon, they, they, the bridge is built by the engineers, and they can cross the river. And then the third Royal Tank Regiment, this time with this um, fourth infantry, light infantry, they advance towards the next uh, the canal, the Dortmund Amps Canal. Uh, and again, they find all, all the bridges to be blown. Um, G Company. They also advance towards this canal and uh, also encounter a, a blown bridge. So the Germans have they've, they've got this defense strategy of uh, yeah, holding up the air stage by stage by blowing and defending these bridges. Um, and it's also in, in the right hand picture, you can see the water levels quite apart from the, from the blown bridge, you can see the water levels quite low. Which was caused by the, the the RAF or the maybe the American Air Force taking out um, the sluice gates, etc. So the water had run out of this, of this canal. Um, anyway, um, also at this other location, a new uh, bridge uh, needs to be built, which can then be seen on the right hand side. Um, and in the meantime. Um, other parts of the rifle brigade they start clearing this area between the, the river and the canal. And it's, it's there the first casualties uh, occur. Uh, one of them being Corporal Ron Mann, who's uh, shown in this, uh, on these two pictures. He's on the, on the right hand side of this uh, group of this, uh, this section. Um, yeah, and also some other rough men. They get they get killed, and some uh, some get wounded. So it, it, yeah, it really starts uh, getting a little bit more difficult. Um, if you take us to the next slide, uh, Paul. Um, the same goes um, when on the on the second of April, after this uh, Dortmund Ems Canal is crossed. Uh, reach the, the village of uh, Tecklenburg. Um, here, they, they when entering the village, they're also met by um, by a bazooka or a pentafast. Um, yeah, in the end, they need need the whole of, of F Company to to hear this um, this village. Um, and well, more and more, uh, more casualties are, are sustained. And it's a big problem in these, uh, well, British, which end up with a lot of them getting killed. You're, you're breaking up again, Ronald, unfortunately. Um, we're losing terrible. the audio. Um, well, I wonder if you can try joining in on your phone instead of your computer, whether that would be better. Um, the, I can't start with a shot. <laughs> again. Um, 
Yeah. Um, well, you're, you're you're breaking up completely again now. This is so right. annoying. I will. Um, I will. I will leave the. Can I stay yeah. in touch with you? Please, the studio is called in the. Yeah. The screen. Okay. And just try, stay in touch just... with you. This is so annoying. Uh, you do all the preparation and it, and it, and he's done all this thing, fake credible slides, and then the connection doesn't work on the day. It's just one of those things. But anyway, folks, um, just to remind what we got coming up, because someone said to talk about what we got coming up. So, um, Eastern Front Week. So far, I've got uh, four of the shows are set up. So we have. Let me just get my diary up while I'm talking to you. So we have uh, a show with Douglas Nash about the three attempts by the Germans to relieve Budapest. Dave, David Stahl is coming on to talk about the retreat from Moscow, which the great thing about his book is, or the unique thing about his book is, he talks about it being actually a German victory. Everyone talks about the retreat from Moscow as being a, a defeat of the Germans by the Soviets, but he's saying it's actually, it was a bit of a Pyrrhic vi victory, and in fact, it allowed the, the, uh, the, the Germans time to rebuild for another offensive. So that would be really interesting hearing his perspective on the retreat from Moscow. Uh, then we also have Susan Grunewald coming in to talk about German POWs, and hopefully we're having a show about the resistance of in Warsaw, the Polish resistance, or possibly the resistance in, in Poland as a whole. So all that's coming up. And then beyond that, I'll just tell you what we've got coming up. The next week in the middle of April will be raids and operations, some of which actually happened and some didn't happen in the sense that we'll be talking about, for example, Operation Foxley which is a raid that never actually happened. We'll be talking about the potential of the Nazis to invade Ireland, which never actually happened. We'll be looking at that plan. Gavin Mortimer, who was on recently talking about David Sterling of the SAS, is coming back on to talk about uh, the uh, Z uh, units out of Australia and particularly what was happening in Berlin. And we will probably have um, another guest talking about another attack, which I completely forgot what it is right now. And then after that, we start our week where we are looking at racism and attitudes towards prejudice and tolerance. We'll be looking in that week, we'll be covering uh, Caribbean pilots in the Royal Air Force. We'll be discover, uh, discussing the discrimination against units uh, like Siberian units in the Red Army. There's lots of stuff coming your way. Well, Ronald is back. Let's see how that is. I've got to stop the camera again. <laughs> Sounds good so far. Okay. I'm sitting right next to this wifi uh, thing. Um, okay, <laughs> let's try again. Yep, yeah, take three. Yeah, it's we'll, oh, we'll yeah. get there. <laughs> um, that's the trouble with live things. Um, no, so, um, I said about this, this is fierce, uh, fierce fighting. Um, so I've got to get into it a, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no worries, we're, we're yeah. good. It's all everyone's very patient. No, so um, in the end, uh, they, they take this um, this village of um, uh, Tecklenburg, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and next day, uh, they continue again towards the next um, river or canal obstacle, and it's a um, it's a stretch of about 15 or 20 miles that they need to cover, and um, they get the order to to capture these bridges uh, there and this they do um, uh, all three companies all three motor companies with their um, uh, 23rd is arts tanks quadrants this time uh, they race for these uh, next bridges uh, g company gets holded when when two um, tanks of them or two tanks of the 23rd is ours get blown up by uh, german 88 millimeter guns which are encountered so is one of the of the scout carriers from uh, from G Company, but the other companies uh, they race on and they manage to capture. Um, F Company gets there first, they manage to to capture two bridges intact. Um, a little bit later, uh, H Company uh, captures uh, even captures a third bridge. So that's it's really a, a very great success. Uh, the bridges are found to be mined. Uh, these mines are taken out. But um, yeah, the bridges are, are captured uh, unopposed without uh, any casualties. And there's, um, well, of course, really a feeling of, of great success um, with the riflemen. 
and also feeling that uh, things um, should become easier. So uh, yes, next morning they, they advance another uh, 25 five miles, and um, they even encountered uh, an ab encounter an abandoned uh, tiger tank. Um, I think about well, one of the very few encountered uh, during the advance, um, which is still warm, by the way. But um, but they don't have to deal with it, so that's that's another uh, quite a success. So that they're they're feeling uh, pretty happy at this stage about how the advance is going. Is it uh, better now, sound wise, or? Yep, it's it's, it's great now. So um, okay, full steam well, ahead. Let's keep going. I'm going to sit here. <laughs> keep sitting here. Um, anyway, so so um, yes, morale is, is very high again. Um, great feeling of confidence. And then they, um, well, of course, they have got to continue. The German army hasn't surrendered yet. So they've got to continue further east uh, towards uh, Stolzenau and the River Weser. And there, um, things will work out very differently. Um, if you go to the next slide, we, um, this time again, F Company, who one or two days earlier, captured these bridges intact. They are again racing towards this bridge at Stoltenau, Stoltenau. And only, um, or well, maybe 100 meters or so before they reach the bridge, it gets blown up right in front of their faces. And the result, of course, can be seen in the, in the right hand lower picture. Uh, they do manage to, to, to shoot up some uh, fleeing, fleeing Germans on the other riverbank uh, who are really panicking at these uh, British troops which have suddenly arrived. But uh, the bridge has been blown, so um, some, some plan again needs to be developed to, to, uh, to build a temporary bridge or a daily bridge or something. And to do so, of course, a bridge uh, needs to be created. So... Um, what they, what they do, what they figure out is that um, F Company will stay on the Western Riverbank and G and H Company will uh, need to, to create a bridgehead on the other side. And they decide to do so uh, by using uh, storm boats and by um, crossing along this uh, destroyed bridge. Um, H Company is to go first with one platoon in these. Uh, folding canvas boats. Uh, we'll stay at this slide for a moment, but I've got a picture of them in the next slide. Uh, each company is going to cross, uh, or 14 platoon is going to cross um, in these canvas boats. And 15 platoon, um, um, they will cross along these, this blown bridge. And they're covered by a smoke screen from the uh, divisional uh, 25 pounders. And that's also why the, the picture on the right hand side is a bit hazy. Yeah, that, that's really all the smoke in the background to, mm -hmm. to cover this crossing. So this really was made on the day the crossing took place. Um, well, the crossing goes quite all right. Uh, two moments. Um, no, crossing goes quite all right. Um, 14 or 15 platoon was, was crossing uh, over this bridge. They. they Come to carry the bridge because it's it's too uh, too difficult. So they also have to cross in uh, canvas boats, and then a 20, 22, 20 millimeter gun opens up on them. Uh, so they've got to switch to the other side. Uh, previously, they were crossing on the east side, now on the south side. Now they will cross on the north side of the bridge, uh, right next to this this little building you see in the in the photo. Uh, I also put in this photo of Captain Philip May. He was standing together with uh, Lieutenant Neil and another, and another officer watching on the riverbank. And he was, uh, he was shot by a sniper. Um, as I say, the, the, one of the officers standing next to him was, uh, was Lieutenant Neil, who I, I met uh, not a long time ago in 2015 and then 2017. And he was really convinced that, that Captain May had been picked out because he was uh, the highest ranking of the three officers. So, uh, yes, unfortunately, 
catch him. He got uh, he got killed there. Um, well, keep in mind when we go to the next slide. Keep in mind the the, the bridge you see here, and this building um, you see, and right behind the building there's there's a crane, which is uh, impossible to make out here, but uh, which is good to know if we go to the next slide. Um, now what you what you see here is the uh, in the left hand photo these canvas boats being taken out of, of lorries. Uh, probably the men from from F Company. Uh, they're folding boats, so they have to be folded out. They're still flat here. And on the right, uh, that's, that's a piece of film uh, from the actual crossing. Uh, you can see one of the one of the canvas boats that uh, to, to, to row to the other side. Um, I'm not sure if they also had a motor, but you also you can really see them rowing. You can also see the fast flowing river. And this is um, yeah the bit right next to the bridge. So this, this is a piece of film of the actual crossing or still of that piece of film. Um, and of course, um, well, the, well, the riflemen, they're, they're crossing the river. And not, not just the riflemen, also uh, two six-pounders and, and jeeps, six-pounder anti-tank guns and jeeps were taken across. Um, so while the riflemen were crossing, uh, the engineers, of course, uh, they were working on this bridge, um, a pontoon bridge. They were they were going to to construct, but you know, probably for the engineers, um, the whole situation at Stoltzenau became more of a nightmare even than for the for the riflemen. Uh, they were working out on the on, in the open uh, to create this this bridge. Uh, they were, of course, subject to, to, to shell fire and mortar fire and everything else from the German troops uh, on the other side. But also, the, it was one of the last appearances uh, well, in, in force, or at least, at least a, few, uh, a few raids, by the German Air Force. Um, we're carrying out bombing missions, even uh, using the, the, the old Stukat planes, which... Um, uh, the RF that they somehow they weren't uh, to be seen, but um, uh, stuck up planes and, and, and um, also uh, fighters uh, bombing this bridging area. And um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, both on um, I believe six, six and seven April, or, no, sorry, on five and six April, they managed to to hit the bridge and also hit the engineers um, during one. Bombing rate for even John, just one hit. Uh, 18 engineers got killed um, while building the bridge. And this was so bad that by the end um, of the 6th of April, you know, after two days of trying to construct this bridge, uh, they had a, um, a direct hit again. And they had to, to give up uh, building the bridge uh, because of lack of, well, not only lack of material, but also lack of men, uh, I'm afraid. Um, but this bridge had, well, the, the, the division or the corps, they, they still wanted to, to keep the bridgehead. So also the, um, the riflemen, they were hanging on on the other side. H Company had been reinforced with uh, G Company. They were supported by fire from F Company from the, from the Western Bank. And these uh, men from, the, from F Company, they, they were firing from their, um, from their half tracks. They had Brownings mounted on the half tracks. They were standing ankle deep in uh, in spent Browning cases. So there was there was a lot of fighting going on against um, well four German companies on the other side, including two SS companies. Um, I think we can go go to the next one. So um, let's see. So after two um, two days and nights, yes, two days and nights, um, yeah, the riflemen they had they had, had about enough. They hadn't, any, of course, they were supported by artillery fire, but they hadn't any heavy weapons on the other side. So they had had about enough uh, after two days of continuous fighting, no sleep, attacks during night, uh, losing uh, a lot of casualties. Um, 
some some 30 men got killed and then 28 wounded uh, out of just two companies and they were uh, relieved by um, by 45 royal marine commander uh, during the night or the early morning of the 7th uh, but even then there were german counterattacks going on and even then they were hit by shell fire and they they also blended so somehow on these uh, uh, commandos because uh, they were well really going around these these commando troops as if, as if nothing was going on and they were also very very visible of course uh, so they were easy to to pinpoint uh, even during this relief for um, for german art artillery and mortar fire so it was um, yeah it was really really a very heavy battle at Stoltz now for the 8th Rifle Brigade. Um, and by seven o'clock in the morning, they had pulled back. And the photo you see here is of nine, nine platoon that, that very day after they had pulled back. They got uh, the rest of the day off, so to speak. Uh, they had a, a period of rest, but only for the rest of the day. Because the next day they had to continue again. And they were able to cross uh, the river Weser along uh, another bridge, which which had been built a bit further south at uh, Petershagen. And on, on the right, you can see one of the comet tanks crossing that bridge. So, um, yeah, quite a quite a heavy engagement at Stoltzenau. Yeah, definitely. So not a not a walkover. Uh, this part of Germany and this part of the war. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the advance continues. Um, still a bit still. further west, uh, further east, a bit further north. Um, and after Stolzenau, the advance uh, continues towards Belsen. Um, not not the uh, name of any significance of course at the at the time certainly not to the riflemen but that was uh was the direction they were they were heading to and um yeah we, we're coming to that part now super um well even before reaching belson there were two uh, two more rivers to cross Again, um, there we see another town. You can read the text. Uh, it's Steimke. Uh, again, SS troops, very young troops, uh, teenagers, but um, yeah, giving very, very stiff, uh, stiff resistance. Um, the result, it, it, it's been the same as a, a few times before. Of course, as I said in the in the beginning, there was not much compassion with the, the well with the villages or with the, the villagers even uh, there was this fierce resistance from these german troops so a lot lot of artillery was uh, was called for uh, the village will will have been uh, been bombed by this artillery um, the troops themselves the riflemen with the tanks they had to take out these uh, these ss troops so uh, rutting, as you can see here. But the end result uh, yeah, was the same as always. The town was destroyed. Uh, lots and lots of Germans were killed. The riflemen were taking uh, a few casualties, but it was all um, yeah, it was all, all, all very, very frustrating. You were asking in the beginning about morale. Well, I think if, if there was anything which was taking down morale, it was this you know, uselessness or senselessness of this defense yeah. being put up by the germans yeah so that uh, that was what was going on um, at steinke again and while two companies were taking steinke uh, f company passed on went past the village uh, found an area where a bridge was, was destroyed we see location here along the river Lina. And again, the engineers built uh, uh, built a fresh bridge. Uh, the bridges, of course, had lots and lots of Bailey Bridge material. 
and um, yeah, the advance continued. Okay, um, I hope things are still fine with sound. I hardly dare to ask, but yep, so good so far. It's all good again. We're we're okay. good. Yep. Oh, it's a shame. Oh, I can see you, but it's a, it's a shame you can't see me. Uh, but I don't dare to to. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll bring your camera back on when we get when we get through the presentation. We bring it on the end. Let's bring the camera yeah. back, but let's not let's not jinx it now. We're doing no. well. <laughs> okay. Um, no, so then we come to to, to the fifteenth of April, um, the liberation of Bergen Belsen concentration camp. Where anyway, when the camp is reached, and uh, although the camp is, is liberated uh, that day, um, it was in fact more more a sort of um, a local truce or or an arranged takeover. Uh, I'll show a bit more about that uh, on, on the next slide. But um, apparently, on an initiative of the Germans, there had been uh, discussions going on about the takeover of the camp. Uh, in the signs, you actually can see here eight rifle brigades, uh, half tracks, uh, passing the camp. Uh, you can see that the Typhus, uh, uh, danger, typhus signs, yeah. which had been put up by the, by the Germans. Um, and uh, yeah, the same on the right hand photo, but that, that's a few days later. The one on, on the left is really on the 15th of April, uh, right. with the 8th Rifle Brigade passing by. And if you go to, to the next one, um, as I said, this arranged takeover. Uh, so the liberation was on the 15th, but already on the 13th, there had been uh, a contact or an agreement had been reached between the Germans um, and the 11th Armored Division um, about the, the takeover of the camp. And you see documents here. I don't, I don't know if the text can be read by, um, by people seeing this, but I've, I've taken some, uh, some quotes out of it. And in the documents, you see, well, you see roughly the right number of, of prisoners, 16,000, uh, huge numbers, of course. But there's no mentioning about, about Jewish prisoner, prisoners. So they were well, apparently told by the Germans that they were political prisoners or, or just plain uh, criminals. Uh, also, the diseases in the camp, they were apparently due to, to loss of electricity and lack of water. That, that's, well, of, all of all complete rubbish, of course. It, it, Mm. Was of course really the way this camp was run by the by the Germans, which had, had caused all this. Um, and um, anyway, as a result of this, uh, some sort of truce was arranged uh, to avoid the spread of these uh, diseases. And an area of, of some two miles around the camp, uh, and there would be no fighting there. Uh, the British could pass through. Uh, these typhus signs were, were were put up by the Germans, and as a as a result, or a short short term feeling for the for the riflemen, at least they hadn't they, they didn't have to fight over that area, so there was a positive uh, thing for them. So they passed the camp without a fight. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, that can also be seen in the um, in the in the war diary from the. Um, from the 8th Rifle Brigade. There's no mentioning at all of the concentration camp in there. It just men mentions uh, Bergen and Belsen. And that's it. Uh, so it's a very short note for this uh, very significant date. But still, um, all, these, all these horrors, uh, they, of course, uh, they reached the riflemen. I suppose even on the 15th, uh, possibly some of them went inside. Uh, and certainly a few days, um, a few days later. Yeah, but also have company history. Uh, the news had reached uh, the, the the riflemen. They also say um, it's, a, it's a quote from their uh, their history. But I say the conditions of those li we liberated is too well known to need repeating. It is sufficient to say that what has been in the newspapers or in the films, far from being exaggerate, exaggerated represents about half the truth wow. and three officers including the uh, the adjutant the, the the writer of this war diary they went back a few days uh, a few days later about a week later 
And one of them was this uh, Lieutenant Brian New, um, who I spoke to uh, a few years ago. And he also gave me a copy of, uh, of a letter he wrote a little later uh, to his sister. And in it, um, well, you can read it, but I'm, I'm going to read it out. It's, it's a five page letter on what he, not just what he saw there, also on uh, asking about how his sister is doing, of course. But he says it was a queer business, as we had to fight almost right up to the notice boards. And then after passing along the road by the camp, which was screened off by trees and therefore almost invisible, that's also part of his text, we again met opposition two or three miles beyond the camp area. So they, they hardly, hardly, most of the riflemen, they hardly saw anything mm. of the camp itself. They just had to go on fighting. And he also says he, of course, had been in the camp after he read this. He wrote this letter. Uh, the main feature of the camp was starvation, slow, methodical, methodical starvation, where the internees were giving just enough food to keep them alive for a few weeks or maybe months while they lived on their reserves, but which finally produced these emaciated bodies that were scarcely human. Um, yeah, and he ends with a, a very understandable sentence, uh, the mentality of people who could impose such conditions is quite beyond me. So it, mm. um, yeah, it, it certainly made a lasting impression on him. Um, and and I, what I, did I, it, or, or many riflemen. Uh, yeah, and what did it know. do for morale? Did it make them want to fight harder? Did it make them just question what the whole war is about? I mean, mind you, you know, the Why We Fight episode of Band of Brothers. What, you know, for the riflemen who saw this, or even if they didn't see it, they heard it from the men who had seen it. What 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 was their mood over the next few days? I don't think it, it influenced them too much. Um, Lieutenant Neil, Neil and the others, they went back. As I say, I, I suppose a few went in even on the 15th. Mm -hmm. But as you will see on the next slide, uh, they had a pause for these these two or three miles. But after that, they had to go on fighting for, for two days, almost continuously. So I... I, I don't. I haven't heard this, and I, I'm well. I certainly know um, quite a few Ralphman um, really found to 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 difficult to deal deal with this part of the war. Yeah, but I'm I'm not so sure if they they spoke or heard too much about it uh, during the days or, or weeks right after. Well, actually, liberating the camp without. Well, with hardly knowing it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't suppose it will have influenced their morale. Uh, yeah, too. I guess too busy, just too busy on yeah, your job, busy, keeping yes. alive, and 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 then it would have been maybe weeks and even months later, even when they've been discharged, then they're finally seeing the newsreels, yeah. then perhaps they'd have realised, as you said earlier, when they saw when they first saw the name Belson on a map, it meant nothing, and now no. of course the word. Belsen, like Auschwitz, like Dachau, it, it means something the world over. But at the time, it was just another town yep. in front of them. So it's, it would take a while for these places to register with the significance of what was happening there. Yes, and it, it was also um, that I do here, the, the, the effect of the war uh, as a whole, or the, or the fighting as a whole, that mm -hmm. only really sank in after, after VE Day, um, that only when it was really over, they began to realize that they, they really had lost these comrades forever and um, yeah the, only then they began to they had time to realize what what had happened so i no, I, I, yeah I, I would actually be surprised if, if it had that much effect at the time okay at the time yeah, yeah. okay yeah. we'll yeah. move on so there's there's still more there's still more fighting to go even though as the people are watching this they're realizing yeah the the net is really closing around the Germans now. I mean, it's it's only a matter of days now. But as you said, this is when the the, the last fierce ditch defence by the Germans, the SS, the Volkssturm, the Hitler Youth. This is it, it's not over yet. So um, I'll let you take us through the next chapter. No, and also also the riflemen that they, of course they didn't know the the war would be over by, by four or five April uh, May. I mean. Uh, so, so they 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 didn't know how long it it, it would last. So they were, of course, they had a feeling it had to end um, in the next days or weeks, but it, it might have might have gone on. Uh, let's say after after uh, something like Stolzenau, 
that could also have, in their minds, it could also have gone on for another few weeks. Um, so yes, after Belsen, it's it's further north. Um, and as I said, there, there's no pause whatsoever. Um, so on the 16th, the, the day after uh, Belsen, they encounter more uh, more Panzerfaust and snipers and everything starts happening again at the, at the village of, of Reiningen. We'll see it on the next uh, slide if you go there, um, Paul. Uh, no, so everything starts again at the village of Reiningen. Uh, they approach the village again. They're met by, by uh, well, a huge amount of fire from uh, from the riflemen. Oh, sorry, from the from the Germans, of course, by 88 millimeter guns. Um, and as always, uh, the village is not is taken uh, not much later. I'm not totally sure if it was here, but there's even a village where where the where the population actually took part in the fighting. So it it, it was really. Yeah, I've used the word uh, frustration a, a few times before, but it, it, it really was frustrating, all, all for nothing. Um, and well, that, that was also affecting the, the, the behavior, of course, of the troops. And I think that can be heard in the, the sound fragment I've put in here. Uh, again, from Don Gullet. It's not something uh, which he witnessed himself, but which he heard at the time. And he's um, well. He's telling about it uh, in the sound bit, sound fragment we're going to listen to. Another episode that characterised this closing phase of the war, uh, I only heard about it, came from uh, one of the other platoons in the company. Apparently, they found a large country house and went inside. And eventually they found themselves in an extremely large room and at the one end of it was a huge oil painting, rather more than life size, of no less a person than Adolf Hitler. It was quite clear that the owner of the place and the family were very much of the Nazi persuasion. Well, apparently the boys weren't altogether stimulated by this, so one of them took out his bayonet, well, a sword in our regiment, and he went up to the picture, put it onto the canvas, and ripped it from top to bottom. At this point, the owner and his Frau appeared, and she took one look at this picture of a shattered Adolf Hitler and burst into hysterical tears and berated these men for their heresy, at which point they said, oh, right, well, we'll search the house for guns. I suppose they could just have come away and done nothing about this. It may be argued that it was quite unnecessary. Uh, but at this stage of the war, there was a pent-up fury that is very difficult to describe 50 years later. So they went downstairs and eventually found their way into the basement. And there was a kind of coal cellar and coal piled up against a wall. And nothing seemed simpler or more logical to them than to take out a an incendiary grenade to rip the cover off and to throw it in amongst the coal and set the blaze going, which they did. And if it seems difficult 50 years later to visualize the kind of mentality that does that sort of thing, it's equally difficult to visualize the kind of pent-up fury which, at that stage of the war, and now being in a position to do it, they felt. Fascinating about his talking about this pent up fury there. This is what you're hitting, hinting at this frustration of the of each village having to be fought over civilians picking up weapons in one of the villages that they, they and the just the months of it building into a real period of 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 anger, I suppose. Yeah, 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 that's true. And um, yeah, combined with the feeling that that it will all, all be over anyway, and the outcome is uh, absolutely certain. So Mm. Um, no, I've also put in uh, two photos of two, 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 uh, one sergeant and one rifleman, uh, Baldwin and Latmore. They uh, for their actions at, at Bar and they, they received the military medal. They, they were the last two um, um, 
yeah, two gall gallantry medals won by the by the battalion during the campaign. Uh, a little over thirty, I think, were. Uh, wow. How do you say? I'm going to say handed out, but that's that's uh, awarded. The right expression. Awarded. awarded yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, something lighter. <laughs> now, on the next day, uh, uh, one of, funnily enough, one of the, the few actions which made the, the British newspapers, uh, I believe, it was was uh, no, F Company. They they encountered uh, the German column of horse-drawn transport, so that wasn't too easy, too too difficult to overcome. But H Company, they um, somewhere inside the woods, they, they saw things moving and heard some strange uh, sounds apparently and uh, uh, they managed to capture a whole circus so that was uh, yeah, a bit of lighter entertainment for uh, for the troops during that day uh, and the photo again is of the of the actual circus which was captured which was already back in business um, a little after uh, VE day um, let's see we can go to to the next slide yeah and to the next and final river uh, because after capturing the the lions and tigers and artists uh, there's a week rest for the rathamon i'm not yet sure exactly why but i think it's it's um, it's also for for bringing up fresh bridging material because a, a lot of course had to be had to be used up Maybe also fresh engineers because they they also had a really really tough job um, putting up these bridges a lot of times under fire. Um, but anyway, finally on the um, what was it? Well, anyway, at the end of April, I think the thirtieth, finally the the River Elbe was crossed um, at Lauenburg. And uh, the bridgehead there had all been, already been captured by the 15 Scottish, which of course were also part of the uh, of Eighth Corps, together with the 11th Armored Division and the Airborne Division. Um, anyway, they moved off uh, very early in the morning of the 30th of April, and they had to deal with traffic jams again uh, towards these bridges. So there were either Germans or traffic jams, which uh, held up the advance. And they crossed only um, only in the middle of the night by so-called artificial moonlight. Now there were, mm. were um, uh, searchlights light shining up uh, towards the clouds, providing this uh, this light. Um, yeah, we go, can go to the next slide for the final part of the uh, of the advance before uh, VE day. And from this on the right hand side, you see the the area again, which was uh, captured. And on the top, you see Neustadt and Travemünde. And they're places which might be good to remember. They're, they're on the Baltic. And they will, I will talk about them in a bit. Um, if we go to the next one, uh, Paul. Um, so, yes, after crossing and passing through the um, crossing the Elbe and passing through the 15 Scottish in the bridgehead. Uh, then the advance goes on all night. Uh, so there's no rest. They've got the advance over secondary roads because uh, the main roads are unmined. So the advance is very slow. And a little bit before daybreak, G Company, they encounter, well, they believe they are Tiger tanks, but they, they can't be certain about that. But anyway, um, uh, one of their, one or two of their carriers get taken out by these uh, tanks and two comet tanks also get uh, destroyed um, and they well all day well g companies held up but the other companies uh, they continue the advance um, and also f company and e company and h company they suffer casualties that day uh, all in the um, all in the carrier platoons so they're the reconnaissance platoons and quite a few casualties through uh, carriers being blown up in, on mines. And um, yeah, H Company um, has even got a carrier blown up by uh, by a sea mine, which apparently has been placed there by uh, mm. by Navy men from the German army. 
And it also turns up um, a carrier like we see in this picture, which is not a rifle brigade picture, but it shows the situation a little bit. And apparently the, the, the effect of the sea mines, it leaves a gap in the road in which you can put a London bus. So it must, must have been quite horrific, but the occupants of the carrier, they, they survived. They managed to crawl out. So even by the 1st of May, um, yeah, casualties are sustained and uh, well, happily they're the last. And then uh, we go to the next slide. By the 3rd of May, the Baltic is finally reached. Um, it's 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 really important important move uh, uh, they made there uh, because uh, they're also blocking the Russian army from advancing towards the north of Germany, towards Denmark maybe, which might have been occupied otherwise by the Russian army. So we would have a, a different situation uh, these days. Um, so yes, that, that that's one of the reasons why it was so important to to have a speedy advance towards um towards the baltic um as i said before um and you can also read it here f company is um uh, capturing travemunde they capture thousands of prisoners uh, and they also meet uh, thousands of refugees refugees germany germans also fleeing from the from the russians an edge company um, uh, reaches Neustadt, also on the Baltic, and there they, they see something strange happening. Um, the sinking of the Cap uh, Darkona, is, Arcona it's called, and one other vessel. And these are their hospital ships. They're clearly marked with red crosses, but somehow they get attacked by uh, British typhoons. Uh, files are still closed on this, so it's still not known why, why this happened. Uh, I've read somewhere that, that maybe the British were afraid that the Germans would take the ships out to sea and then sink them. Because on board of them there were, um, well, I think well over 10,000 uh, German prisoners, concentration camp victims. Uh, and unfortunately some 7,000 7, got killed. It was one of the largest uh, ship disasters of the war. Um, some managed to reach the, the key or reach land. Uh, not just some prisoners, also some of their guards. They were uh, dealt with, uh, not killed, I believe, but, but certainly beaten up by uh, riflemen and commandos, uh, which were present, British commandos. And the riflemen, they also handed out food to the prisoners, which was fatal to some of them because they weren't, of course, used to, to having a a decent amount of food in their stomach. So that was that was a very decent thing to do, but not a, not a good thing to do. Um, so yes, that, that was a, certainly a very, very sad uh, thing. Um, yeah, I think that the last very serious thing I encountered during the war. And uh, here again, uh, quite a few prisoners were taken and uh, I, well, I thought it would be nice to put in this uh, fragment from uh, Don again, describing the uh, capturing of some of these prisoners. Yep, let's do that. So this is the final audio clip, it's folks. The final it, audio bit, yeah. This has been amazing. So it's in, it's sit back and enjoy it. Here we go. May the 3rd was not a day altogether of harrowing experience. There were two other experiences that I had, which I regarded with some pleasure. The first concerned a couple of German officers, one of whom was a major, strolling along the promenade as proud as a couple of Prussian peacocks at the height of their powers. And this all seemed to me astonishingly out of touch with reality and inconsistent with the state of the war as we knew it. So I decided to give them a refresher course. In any case, we had been used to grabbing anybody in field gray uniform and pushing them down the line to a prisoner of war cage. I didn't see any reason why they should be exceptions. And if ever I saw a couple of potential prisoners, here they were. So I stepped up to them and invited them to give us the pleasure of their company on my carrier prior to a longer trip back to a prisoner of war cage. 
to my amazement, they walked on talking together as if they were not going to be interrupted by a mere road sweeper, which of course didn't get on the right side of me. So I drew my revolver and I told the arrogant bastard to get onto my carrier. He still ignored me, so I fired a shot into the ground. And at long last he spoke. He turned to me as if I was one of his underling fools and said, My company is here. Which was supposed to explain everything to me, dolt as I was. He was going to surrender with his whole company. Well, in the end, I'm sure his company had to surrender without him because the next thing that happened is some of the boys came along, we all got hold of each two, put them on my carrier, we drove them back a couple of hundred yards and then dumped them for the prisoner of war cage. We weren't having that nonsense. I was absolutely livid with fury. Would these arrogant monkeys never look up at the scoreboard and see not only that they had 10 wickets down, but they were also about to be asked to follow on. I don't think they could believe it even then. Wow. Amazing clip. Uh, just yes. the, the use of language is incredible. Just the quintessential English gentleman who... <laughs> kind of gets angry without actually showing anger just sort of just then the the reference to cricket at the end just fantastic uh, it was quite a fan of uh, of cricket um so yes yeah, so that that almost wraps it up um no so of course then uh, a day later on the 4th of may nine o'clock in the evening uh i think through the company radio there finally comes the news that the, that the war in Europe will be at an end um, um, large parties and small parties they, they break out everywhere I think um, these are actual photos of the of the day after so to speak uh, they're from I think they are from 13 platoon by the way from each company mm -hmm. same company as Dylan Don Gillick was in um so yes lots of parties uh it says somewhere that all the liquor that was acquired over the previous 11 months was uh, was exhausted by the end of the of the night but anyway on the 8th there were some celebrations again uh lots of fireworks going on but they're using up the parachute flares and very lights and trip wires and everything they could lay their hands on uh, apparently they had found a bit more booze because uh a little bit later, they, they or a little bit later, much later, I think they started firing live ammunition. But uh, luckily, no casualties were were caused. So yes, by by four or five, eight May, it was was really over. Uh, and of course, as I said before, apart from all the celebrations, uh, even then, uh, it really began to 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 sink in what they had experienced and how lucky they were to have survived. And how uh, well unlucky quite a few of their mates uh, had been, um, because in all the, the battalion had some eighty percent casualties, uh, nearly nearly seven hundred casualties, uh, over wow. one hundred and sixty killed. Um, so yes, they really had uh, quite a campaign during these uh, eleven months. Um, so that's that's the war finished. I've, I've got one one or two more sheets um, of what happened after that. Because even after that, it wasn't uh, packing up and going back to England. Uh, quite a few troops said they were only demobilized uh, in, even in 1947. Uh, so they, they had to stay on in Germany as an occupation force. And that uh, the 8th Rifle Brigade did at uh, Schleswig, which we see in the north. So a few days after VE Day, they went to, to Schleswig. If we go to, to the next slide. Um, and they were, were in a sort of, on the, on the edge of a sort of uh, large inland lake. And of course, uh, well, life was much, much better there. There was no, uh, most important of all, no fighting going on. Uh, they could do, do swimming and sailing on the lake. Uh, they had to act as an occupation force, but they, they could also do trips to the Kiel Canal, where this uh, upturned battleship uh, could be seen. Uh, so yeah, life was much, uh, much better. 
And they're also built it a bit better. You can see it on the next uh, slide in the local uh, Schloss. Uh, a dump from the inside, but looking uh, well, quite nice from the outside. Uh, they could use uh, the beaches were fenced off for the British troops. And there was non fraternization so no uh, no pleasant talking to the to the people living there. Uh, quite difficult with children, uh, of course. But it was was uh, well, they were held to it certainly for the first few uh, weeks and months. Um, so yes, it was um, it was all over. Uh, they still had to be in Germany for quite a while. And by uh, April, only by April 1945, or sorry, 46, in early 46, the division was disbanded. And in April 46, also the 8th Rifle Brigade was disbanded. And uh, well, lots of troops had left by then. Some were transferred to other units. And as I said, uh, some troops even had to, to hang on, carry on till, uh, till 1947. So, uh, yeah, that gives some idea of uh, this last, what's it, six weeks of the war, which were yeah. quite eventful, we like like the rest of it uh, before that. Yeah. Well, well, let's try and let's try and switch your camera back on so we can we can see you to to, to end to end things. Yeah. Brilliant. And yeah. as you know, as you said there, you know, and you've got the slide here. You know, you're using photos that are you know available generally, but a lot of these have come from the veterans and things you've spoken to, and and the you know, the the men you've met over the years, and and it's an incredible resource. And uh, and and yet they're all they're already celebrating. Um, the Normandy a year later, they're still they're still thinking back to Normandy. So incredible. Yeah, nice to see it. it, it it's dated on the 13th, 13th of June, uh, the day uh, the Eighth Rifle Brigade landed. So it's, it, this also comes from uh, from one of the veterans, Sergeant Froon. But yes, it's it, it's documents and and stories and photos still, um, yeah, uh, getting in more or less on a on a weekly basis. Yeah, no, so brilliant that, stuff. It's also with, and it, it's as I, I don't know if I told you before the the, the broadcast, so to speak, or uh, in the beginning of this. But it's it's also a two way uh, thing. I can also sometimes provide information to to the families, um, and the other way around. So that's that's really nice. And and so there the resources there. So the, the Facebook page is obviously working right now, but for some reason your actual website is down at the moment. That, that it'll it, you'll you'll sort that out, I guess. So we'll be up in a few days. Uh, yeah. So I mean, well, this is the point. We we talked before we went live about the importance of people like yourself doing this work because I want to remind folks watching this: there are there are professional historians we have on who who are making their living from talking about World War Two, and they're great and they're fantastic. And there are people like Ronald for whom it's a hobby and a passion. And, you know, you've spent the best part of most of your adult life putting together these histories and, and putting this website together and not just for, you know, for, for the for, for your information, but as you said there, to provide information for the families. Lots of people will be searching their um, family trees these days. And, you know, it's all it's all just a hobby. So um, you, people like yourself should be commended for doing what you're doing. And I think everybody can agree that what you're doing is an important job. And, Every battalion deserves a Ronald, is what I think we're we're, we're all thinking yeah. right now. Yeah, I, I like to do it. Um, of course, uh, they also saw uh, fighting in Holland, so they also liberated uh, my country um, uh, in in part, of course. Uh, so yes, there's, there's also a bit in between, of course, Normandy and Germany. So maybe that's that's for another time. But it's um, and also also like to uh, because it's it, I think it's regarded as as a well, they say an ordinary unit uh, that they, they, they were bear, wearing uh, berets. So, so really at the time they were seen as, as some sort of elite, which I believe they already wear, wear they also wear. But I think nowadays that they're, they're probably regarded by, by most people as some something of an ordinary unit. There were lots of conscripts in it, of course, uh, but they, they also did, uh, yeah, saw and did some some really amazing things. And I think that, that that's very good to know that it's um, you know, really a really large part of this this big army which which was involved in uh, you know, some some major events uh, at the time, 
And well, not, uh, just, uh, not just the units which we which we see uh, regularly, like. Uh, well, that's what I'm saying. We we just you know we 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 tend to focus on the airborne units and the commandos and some of the flashier armor divisions. But you know, just the distance that was covered in essentially six weeks of presentation. I mean, it's nearly 500 kilometers in my by my by my assessment there, and yep. and how many bridges that had to be built built, and it's an it's a it's a, an example of as we said at the beginning how efficient. The, the British Army has come by this point of the war. You know, when, when we do shows about the British Army in 1940, 41, they're, they're learning the ropes. They're still struggling with equipment by now. As you say, they've got the Comet tank. They know how to whip up these Bailey bridges in a matter of minutes almost. Yeah. Uh, they can work out this the artillery bombardments very well. They've got air support. They've got everything. It's a testament to how well these units were functioning by this period. And just... Exactly when when people are losing interest, and by people I mean people interested in history, they're losing interest in this sort of March, April, May period. When in fact, the British and Canadian armies are demonstrating their efficiency. That's it's, it's almost the best time to examine them because they're doing everything generally very very well at this point of the war. Yeah, and of course, uh, resistance resistance from the German side is is, is really increasing uh, yeah. again after this crossing of the Rhine. Yeah. So increasing uh, and getting more desperate so um yes yes desperate is a is the right word for it well we've we've got through it we've, we've got through the technical difficulties well thank you for your patience thank you for the patience of the audience sticking with it and we're there so i'll i'll just um um say thank you very much for joining us ronald and good luck i hope the website is up and up up and running again soon and folks don't forget I say all the resources you need are in the description below to Ronald's website. And there are, you have more audio clips. You've got 12 hours of cassette. So you can, yes. you can come back on at some point and talk about another aspect and there's stuff available on your website and there's after. Yeah, let's, let's hope our uh, internet has improved by then. Yeah. Let's hope you get fiber optics in the Netherlands by then or something, but it'll be yeah. great. So brilliant. So this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying, I will see you all tomorrow from our, our final show in this little batch this week when we are talking about US military crime part three. So cheers, everybody. Thank you for watching. Bye.